Okay, today it is Laplace's equation in a three-dimensional interior of a, of a three-dimensional body. We're going to do this in simple Cartesian coordinate system uh, to keep things simple at first, and then we'll switch to spherical coordinates later. Uh, so this is called a Dirichlet problem in 3D uh, because we have specified the boundary values um, uh, for this particular problem. Uh, if you if you uh, want to think of it this way, uh, we've got uh, we've got boundary conditions on the sides of this block, which goes off to infinity, uh, that are that are saying that u, the unknown, that's a function of x, y, and z, is equal to zero on this surface, which is y equals one. Also down below, we have a u equals zero at y equals zero, and here on this front face, we have u equals zero at x equals one, and on the back side, we have u equals zero at x equals zero. Um, out here at z equals infinity, the solution, we're going to require this to go to zero. And so, you know, Laplace's equation, one of the things that we know about Laplace's equation is that all of the um, uh, extreme values must occur on the boundary. If we make this surface also be zero, then the solution on the inside has to be zero everywhere. Uh, but this is going to be non-zero, and that's going to going to propagate some depth of the way into the interior before uh, before that solution gets damped out by the uh, surrounding boundaries and their influence on the on the solution in the interior. Okay, so uh, these are my boundary conditions. Uh, they're u equals zero at all these locations. Um, and uh, this is the equation to describe in the bulk. This describes uh, transient, or, or sorry, uh, steady state heat conduction uh, or steady state diffusion through this, through this uh, long rod, uh, long rectangular rod um, going off to infinity. Um, so the, the boundary condition at the end is the interesting one. That is uh, that, that uh, the, the temperature profile, if you want, is a function of position on the end of the rod. And uh, that's true at x equals 0. Okay, so um, so with that little uh, explanation of the problem, uh, let's move forward and dive in and solve this thing. Um, so so this is the Laplacian. Uh, it's just the sum of second derivatives with respect to all of the different uh, the x, y, and z coordinates. When we assume now a separation of variable solution, we have a homogeneous partial differential equation with homogeneous boundary conditions at least in the directions x and y, right? So uh, so we expect uh, for x and y to have different behavior from z. And so when we separate variables, the first thing we're going to do is to separate z from the x and y uh, so that we have the non-homogeneous type boundary conditions over here in the z dependence and the homogeneous type boundary conditions over here in the x and y dependence. And so what, so what we get out of that is one equation that says that x prime prime over x plus y prime prime over y is equal to minus mu squared. That's our separation constant. Um, we guess minus mu squared uh, because we want the z prime prime uh, to look like this, right? So z prime prime has this uh, uh, mu squared um, uh, prefactor. So this is going to give us exponential solutions, one of which will grow, one of which will decay, and uh, those are given here. Um, so we already can anticipate what the solution for z is going to look like, but we have no idea what these values for mu are going to be just yet. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, now recognize that this thing is also uh, a separable equation. I have part of this that depends on x and part of it that can be moved to the other side of the equation if we wanted that only depends on y. Um, so we have the ability to change x uh, and not change y. That means that these two things must both, both be constants again. Same argument that we've used many times in the past. And so we can now introduce two new separation constants that say that this and this must both be constants. But they're constrained now because these two constants have to add to the original separation constant that we had before. And that's just saying that mu squared has to be equal to the alpha squared plus beta squared, which are the separation constants associated with the x and y dependents respectively. So uh, if we go through and we solve the x equation, we find that it's a linear combination of cosine of alpha x and sine of alpha x. Uh, plugging in our first boundary condition that x has to be 0 uh, that big X has to be zero when little x is, is equal to zero, uh, tells us that this term would have vanished anyway. Uh, the one that remains is the a cosine of alpha x, which just goes to one when x is, little x is zero. And so that says that big A has to be zero. Okay, we've done these problems quite a few times, and you know how this is going to come out. Uh, the, the boundary condition at x equals one now is going to require uh, not that we say anything about b, but that we say something about the values of alpha. Uh, that will make when x is 1, that will make this argument um, a multiple of pi uh, so that it will, so that it, the sign will vanish. Okay, so uh, that gives us x 
uh, eigenfunctions that look like this, sine of n pi x, and y eigenfunctions that look like this, also sine of n pi y. Um, so these are expressions for alpha n and beta n, and, uh, and so we can go through now and uh, see where this leads us, right? So now we're starting to have a definite uh, prescription for what are these uh, mu squared, mu n m squared. Remember that was a separation constant from the very first stages when we separated z from the x and y. Uh, that tells us now uh, that uh, since mu n m squared has this form, uh, that the z solution is going to be have coefficients that will be dependent on those n and m variables, uh, n and m indexes. And uh, here, here's my exponentially growing solution, my exponentially decaying solution. I clearly want, as z goes to infinity, for the solution to decay. So that says I have to make this coefficient be equal to zero. Okay, so the general solution now, um, the general solution is that I have a uh, double sum over n and m of the coefficient uh, b and m with the exponentially decaying uh, z dependence multiplied by the eigenfunctions for the x and y variables, right? So note that we have uh, two separation constants here that came out of a, a Dirichlet problem with three variables, right? x, y, and z. And uh, so that's the typical situation. Um, and uh, typically you're going to need uh, one of those variables um, to describe sort of the interior dependence and the others uh, will describe the eigenfunctions that allow you to expand the boundary conditions in your problem. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now is uh, to go through and write down that we know that u of x and y at z equals zero is a function of x and y, right? This is my boundary condition that I'm going to use the orthogonality property of these eigenfunctions and I'm going to expand this f of x and y. And it will tell me what coefficients go into my solution. Okay, so I've got a sum from n equals one to infinity, sum from m equals one to infinity. Uh, when I let z equal zero, this exponential just goes to one and my uh, u of x, y, and zero must become this thing. Okay, so now when I use orthogonality, I'm going to take a particular value, k and l. Um, so I'm going to take the, uh, the uh, k and l eigenfunctions in x and y, and I'm going to uh, basically take the inner product of this entire equation. And uh, so what, that, what that's going to do is leave me with an inner product here, uh, which really can't be simplified without saying something specific about the nature of this function f of x and y. But on the other side of the equation, when I, when I take the inner product of this summation with, uh, with sine k pi x and sine l pi y, then what happens is that orthogonality gets rid of all the terms for which k is not equal to l and, uh, and m is not equal to uh, n. Okay, so, uh, so now we have um, the, the ability, so we can actually even separate this, these integrals, the x and y dependents completely factor into two pieces and all that's left is bkl, uh, the terms that are, that are uh, diagonal terms, if you will, uh, the non-mixed terms and the, um, each of these integrals contributes a factor of one half. Um, remember back at the beginning of the class we had the little mnemonic for doing those integrals in our, in our heads. And uh, okay, so this is bkl. Uh, now is equal to four times this inner product of the uh, the initial condition uh, or the the z equals zero condition I should say uh, multiplied by sine of k pi x uh, sine of l pi y and then integrated over uh, the entire cross section of of the beam on the end and uh, these are just graphically showing some of the solutions I've plotted them out on Mathematica starting with a f of x and y that's equal to one right. Uh, so what you expect is that very near the the tail end, the z equals zero end, this thing is going to be almost uniformly one across that uh, across a cross section of the pipe. And as I move farther and farther out along my squared rod, uh, I'll find that um, the corners get more rounded and uh, the solution in the interior drops farther and farther away from one until you know when I get out to something like u of x y at ten, I probably can't tell the difference visually at least. Um, between this function and uh, and zero, um, so it will have decayed by that time. Uh, okay, that is it.